The biggest anti-government protest in Jordan in years. Tax rises, the cost of living and austerity measures are stoking demands for the Prime Minister to resign. What role are regional powers playing in the crisis? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. Hundreds of Jordanians have spent the past few days voicing their anger at proposed tax increases and what they say is the already intolerable high cost of living. They accuse the government of covering up failed economic policies and demand the resignation of Prime Minister Hani Al-Mulki. Jordan's economy has struggled in recent years because of the conflicts in neighboring Syria and Iraq and a shortfall in foreign aid. So, can a compromise be reached to avert a full-blown crisis? We'll put that question to our guests in just a moment, but first, Hannah Hoxter has our report. They're the largest anti-government rallies in five years in what's regarded as one of the most stable Middle East countries. The protest movement, initially started by trade unions, has swelled nationwide as Jordanians show their frustration. <laughs> The citizens now have no power. They're searching for their children's daily food. Women are looking in garbage containers to feed their kids, and every day we are surprised by rising prices and new taxes. The problem is, it's not just the tax law. The Jordanian citizen right now, his pockets are empty, are completely empty. Uh, so the government has to listen to the sound of the people. Jordan is one of the most expensive uh, countries in the region and on the top of the world too with no resources that's unjust to the people of Jordan the increase in sales tax and employees being taxed more has infuriated the protesters and they want the government to resign King Abdullah has stood by Prime Minister Hani Mulki despite calls to fire him the King's been instead calling for talks between MPs and government ministers but Mulki is under international pressure to reform Jordan's economy and cut its $37 billion debt. That is equivalent to 95% of GDP. The International Monetary Fund approved a 700 million loan to Jordan two years ago to lower public debt and increase growth. Jordan relies heavily on financial help from the US, UAE and until recently Saudi Arabia, which has cut funding. King Abdullah is a key U.S. ally in the strategically important region which borders Syria, Israel and Iraq. Regional turmoil has worsened the kingdom's money problems and it's sheltering 1.4 million Syrian refugees. That's according to the Hashemite government. And those refugees look no closer to returning home. It also has a large population of refugees from the war in Iraq. Plus 2 million Palestinian refugees have settled in the kingdom. The king recently reversed plans to raise petrol prices following protests, and these latest protests against austerity measures are a further demand for change. Hannah Hoxter, Al Jazeera. Well, let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Amman is Lamis Andoni, an independent journalist focusing on Middle Eastern and Palestinian affairs. In Beirut, we have Rami Khoury, senior fellow and professor at the American University of Beirut. And here in Doha, Ibrahim Freyhat, associate professor in conflict resolution at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. Thank you all. Welcome to Inside Story. Let me see if I can start with you in Amman. Uh, the protests over austerity measures in Jordan have been going on for some time now. Until now, they've been fairly small in scale and hadn't spread. So why has the discontent, in your opinion, finally boiled over? Well, it's a, an accumulated feeling of anger and frustration among all stratas of and all uh, uh, classes in Jordan that the, that, that the con uh, consecutive governments have been uh, dealing with the Jordanian citizens with total disregard, no accountability, no sense of good governance, or no sense of uh, the concept of social justice. So the, uh, the income tax, the flawed income tax, was just a trigger 
that just brought everything uh, to the surface and united many people, including people who are, have been staunch loyalists and have been critical of the opposition in the past. They brought them out on the streets, especially among young people. Every time I go, I see new, I, see, I meet new people who've never thought would go on the streets to, do, uh, to protest against the Jordanian government. Mm. And they're sending not only, uh, they're sending the palace a message that enough is enough. So what then, Lamis, has been the government's so the, response to the protests? And more specifically, what has the king's response, King Abdullah's response been to the discontent? Is he fully aware of just how angry Jordanians are right now? Uh, pr frankly, I, cannot, I don't know and I'm not sure because there, there are no, there's nothing to suggest that he's aware. He made a statement uh, during a meeting of the higher council, political council or political policy co policies council, saying that people shouldn't be uh, left alone to bear the responsibility and the burden of uh, uh, the debt and the crisis. But in effect, all measures, including price hikes, uh, uh, sales taxes, horrendous sales taxes, and the flawed income tax, I have no sense if he has a sense of the depth of the anger. Because I don't think so, because otherwise there would have been uh, a revision, an announcement that he's ready to revise all policies, to reassess all policies. While, as for the prime minister, every time he speaks, he provokes more people into joining the protest. The king has to understand that unless there is a fundamental revision of the policies, there'll be no quieting down. Okay. Rami of Khoury in Beirut, uh, your thoughts. What, what do you see as the root cause of this crisis in uh, Jordan? And is the conflict in Syria only to blame for the economic problems and the situation that Jordan has been faced with in recent years? I lived in Jordan for about 30 years and from the 70s till the early 2000s and experienced several of these waves of demonstrations and I was there just a few days ago for four days and talked to many people in the government and outside the government. So my impression is that this is a structural chronic problem in Jordan because the, uh, f the fact is that the central government has been unable to make any tangible lasting progress on the central vulnerability of the country, which is a growing population. It was two million when I was there in the 70s. It's now about nine million with the refugees. A massive expansion in population. And the government can't possibly keep up either with the economic growth rate to provide jobs or with the expenditures to provide essential services, including housing, security, education, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so this is a problem that Jordan has grappled with unsuccessfully for the, about the last 40 years. There are political reasons for this. There are regional tensions, wars all across the region, right. and shifting uh, global uh, alliances. And so it's a combination of all of these things, and it happens over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it's probably going to have the same result this time, with the king stepping in, changing some of the provisions, continuing with some of the austerity measures, and then we'll do it again in seven years. Okay, and I would like to uh, talk a bit more about the regional influence and the shifting uh, geopolitics in the region and the impact it has on Jordan in just a few minutes. But I want to bring in Ibrahim uh, here in Doha first. Ibrahim, your thoughts on these protests? As we've said, it's not the first time that we've seen uh, anti-austerity demonstrations in Jordan. Do you feel that it's different this time around, that it's more serious this time around? Well, I agree with Rami. It's a structural problem, actually. Uh, the uh, Jordanian economy is uh, foreign aid dependent. Uh, now, uh, there is uh, the Jordanian, uh, the, the debt is about uh, $35 billion, which is about 90% of the uh, GDP, 90% uh, of the Jordanian GDP. So it's definitely a structural problem that this debt has accumulated all this long without being the government has been able to deliver, uh, you know, to respond to these challenges. Um, in addition, it's not only about this, but also there is uh, a widespread corruption or at least perceived corruption among the people because most of, if you look at the slogans raised in these protests, uh, most of them talking about corruption um, as one reason. 
Um, and in addition, of course, there is the elephant in the room is the political factor, which is the regional pressure uh, that uh, Jordan is receiving uh, from, from the region mm -hmm. uh, because of its position on Jerusalem and uh, right. the American deal and all of that. And I think we will discuss it. But uh, that's, that's definitely, uh, in my view, this could, uh, uh, this is probably unprecedented in the past uh, six or seven years, actually. Okay. There were se a lot of uh, protests in the past during the Arab Spring, but I don't think that uh, we have seen this level of protest, uh, of protest taking place, especially, in my view, the main reason, actually, that uh, this tax increase has hit the middle class in Jordan. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, we are seeing uh, people protesting and participating in this protest. Uh, we are seeing communists, Islamists, Ba'athists, uh, you name it, uh, from all types of political affiliations are joining all um, in this protest and responding to the and rejecting the, uh, the government uh, increase and demanding the government to, re to resign. Lamis, uh, just uh, talking about this widespread anger, as uh, Ibrahim says there, it really is everyone that seems uh, upset over these uh, issues in Jordan. There's already been a general sales tax hike this year. A subsidy on bread has been scrapped. Uh, there's been an increase in fuel and electricity uh, prices. I I'm just curious to know how Jordanians are getting on on a daily basis. And, you know, what will it take for this anger, anger to subside? What do people want from the government immediately? Uh, the living conditions are deteriorating, uh, and the middle class this time was hit hard. But if you go outside Amman and in some poverty pockets in Amman, you'll find that people are really getting desperate. I've visited villages outside Amman, north and south, and I was in Salt. Oh, it, it's, uh, it's a city uh, near Amman uh, that has been witnessing for the last 200 days uh, uh, nightly protests every night. There's uh, uh, people feel that if things continue like that, they will not be able to make things meet, mm -hmm. uh, and they don't feel that there was a serious uh, effort on the part of uh, the government to find alternative solutions to cover the deficits. The easiest solution is to levy taxes, and to levy uh, taxes without uh, at a time when there is rising in unemployment and there are high uh, uh, prices. Uh, high prices. The thing is, unlike the other times in the, that uh, the other, uh, my other friends are talking about, uh, this time around, it's not enough to sack the prime minister. People are really placing the blame at the door of the palace. Mm. I've been to the protests, and the sentiment there is so strong, in, including of people who usually support the state, that feeling that it's not that the, the governments the consecutive governments are no long, uh, are no more than puppets for the palace. So this is why it's dangerous. They're placing the blame at the door of the king. Right. That uh, and and uh, uh, that the, there's also a feeling in Jordan. Yes, there are regional pressures, but how can the king face the regional pressure uh, pressures if he are lo if he loses his constituency? This is the main question. Okay. You don't lose. Uh, you don't face pressures from America mm -hmm. or from other party by uh, uh, alienating your people let's, or let's, the constituents. Uh, okay, Lamis, let's talk about these regional pressures and why what happens in Jordan matters. Uh, its geographical position and regional role have shaped foreign policy and been crucial to internal stability. King Abdullah's Hashemite dynasty is the custodian of sacred sites in Jerusalem. He's angered the U.S. by criticizing Donald Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. America spends nearly uh, $1.3 billion dollars in Jordan every year. That's money it sends every year to Jordan. Air bases in the kingdom are launching pads for U.S. military operations. The Jordanian government partially supported the Saudi Arabia-led blockade on Qatar uh, by downgrading ties, but the Jordanian embassy wasn't closed. A five-year aid package worth around $3.6 billion from GCC states ended 18 months ago. So Rami Khoury, to what extent um, is what's happening regionally and you know, the shifting geopolitics of this region affecting and impacting what we're seeing in Jordan right now, this current crisis? It's affecting it very much. In fact, it's one of uh, the several new developments that make this uh, set of demonstrations and this wave of popular 
protest more significant and more dangerous than all the previous ones. Uh, the first thing is that historically, meaning from, say, the 50s on, whenever you had anger inside Jordan, economic stress, the, the government, the king, King Hussein in the past and King Abdullah more recently, always could find some counterbalancing power to come in and give him a couple hundred million dollars, 500 million dollars, mm -hmm. the investments, and patch up the, the deficit. They can't do that anymore because all of the uh, critical elements around them that supported them, the EU, the Americans, the Saudis, the Gulf, some, the Japanese, others, they've pretty much either maximized what they can give or they've gotten tired, or they don't have good relations with Jordan as close as, as they used to. The second thing is the outlet you had for hundreds of thousands of Jordanian workers to go work in the Gulf and other places to compensate for the lack of jobs at home, that doesn't exist um, anymore. And third thing is the political position taken by the Saudi and Emirati and other leaders trying to create a new Arab leadership that is close to the Israelis, that close to Trump, uh, pressuring Qatar, wanting to remake the Arab world in its image. The Jordanians don't go along with this. The government and the people don't particularly want to be part of uh, this new process. So there's no mechanism anymore today for Jordan to find relief uh, in regional or global partners as it used to in the past. And that's why they felt they had no op option other than to go to the IMF. If I can just add to that one other point, which is at the popular level, what's happening in Jordan now is exactly what happened in the Arab uprisings in this psyche of ordinary people. Uh, I don't mean the results will be the same, but people, the reason people are so angry is because they perceive now that there is no sa safe savior coming. There's no right. succor coming. There's no relief um, coming to help them. And they, a lot of people see themselves in perpetual poverty, vulnerability, and marginalization for generations to come. That wasn't the case in the past, no. but there are starting to be hundreds of thousands of Jordanians who feel this, and that's what we're seeing. Ibrahim Fayyad, your thoughts on these external forces and powers and their role in the current crisis in Jordan. Some analysts have said uh, Jordan's stance over Jerusalem has been uh, a source of tensions with Saudi Arabia, which, as we have seen recently, is increasingly towing uh, Washington's line. Is there a direct connection to be made between the kingdom's stance on Jerusalem and its current economic woes? Well, in last February, King Abdullah was meeting with the students uh, from the University of Jordan, and he spoke clearly about this. He said that we are under tremendous pressure, uh, economic pressure, as a result of our uh, position on Jerusalem. And he went ahead to say that Jerusalem will always be um, a red line for us. So definitely Jordan has not subscribed to the uh, this forming alliance uh, in, the, in the region on the issue of Jerusalem and confronting Iran and all of that and what's called the ultimate deal, the, this American-Saudi-Israeli alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, King Abdullah has refused to be part of this. King Abdullah was summoned to Riyadh uh, just before the OIC, the uh, Organization of Islamic Cooperation Summit in Istanbul. Um, uh, in Riyadh, uh, was summoned in Riyadh and was asked not to go uh, to this summit. And he went actually from Riyadh straight to Istanbul in an open defiance uh, to the regional pressure on the issue of Jerusalem. And he maintained his position that uh, Jerusalem, we're not compromising on Jerusalem. Uh, we will always maintain our position on that. So uh, I think Jordan, which traditionally, by the way, uh, was always part uh, of this uh, uh, Arab moderate alliance, uh, the pro-West, pro-America alliance. But we started to see these differences uh, uh, appear on the Jordan position, especially on Jerusalem and the ultimate deal uh, position. Right. Uh, we have seen actually the, uh, um, the Saudi and the Emirati investment in Jerusalem uh, decreased. Uh, the last uh, three years, actually, the Saudi subsidy of $100 million, $180 million were not uh, paid for Jordan. And there is also what's called the oil grant mm -hmm. uh, from Saudi Arabia that also Jordan used to receive in the past uh, has not been received uh, uh, either. So uh, the Jordan not subscribing to this uh, ultimate deal alliance to reshape the politics of the region and 
okay. compromise in Jerusalem has definitely cost uh, Jordan, uh, you know, this issue. And that's why I call it, it's the Jerusalem tax that, that Jordan is, is paying uh, for the moment. Okay, before I bring back Lamis into the conversation and ask you, Lamis, about, uh, you know, how the king should be handling this external pressure and also the internal pressure, I want to just bring back Rami quickly from Beirut on, on particularly this. You know, if the various reports are to be believed, Rami, it would seem that Jordan's role as an interlocutor between, uh, you know, the Gulf states and Israel has diminished because some of these gold states, i.e. Saudi Arabia, are now directly dealing with the Israelis, even if it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, discreetly, they are directly dealing with them. Do you think uh, Jordan still has a strategic value then for this region? Is, for instance, Jordan's role as a custodian of the holy sites in Jerusalem at risk now because of what's happening in this region? The role uh, of Jordan as custodian of the holy sites is important for Jordan and for some Palestinians and others, but it's not a major regional strategic element. Mm -hmm. um, the people in the Gulf and other places don't really focus on that at all. Historically, and when I say historically, I don't mean just in the last 50 years. I mean since the early Bronze Age, since 3000 BC, Jordan has always survived by finding its place among the big regional powers, many of whom are aggressive, whether it was Babylon and Byzantium or Trump and Israel today, whoever it is, they've always been able to find their niche and try to be friends with everybody and, and be a safe haven uh, and, as, and a border zone that's important for trade, among other things. That role is increasingly under uh, jeopardy today because people don't particularly need the uh, buffer that Jordan provides, because all of the big countries in the region, Iran, Syria, Turkey, Israel, Iran, Saudi Arabia, they all feel they can take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. So there is a strategic change happening in Jordan's regional role and its ability to, to parlay its own stra strategic geography uh, into political relationships. And this is where the king in Jordan is really challenged now to reconsider how best Jordan can protect itself um, and the main answer to that is to have the strategic allegiance of his own people and the support of his own people. I think he understands that in his bones. Uh, his father certainly did. Uh, but trying to um, do that while at the same time having enough money to pay your bureaucrats and your soldiers and your school teachers, that's the great challenge that Abdullah faces in Jordan today. Okay, let me give Lamis the last word. So Lamis, how does King Abdullah deal with this dual challenge, the external pressure of regional powers well, well, and the internal pressure? How does he deal with the crisis? Uh, actually, yeah, first of all, people are not totally buying the Jerusalem tax. People are aware of the pressure. I can't speak on behalf of many, but I do go to the protests and uh, are aware of the tremendous pressure on Jordan. But the crisis has not just started now. The economic crisis has started in 2011, and there were many, many chances for the government to prove that it's accountable, to find alternatives, to present to the IMF an alternative plan in order to increase production and increase the productive system, uh, 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 the, the uh, the, the revenues mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't start with the Saudis uh, and and the Emirates pressuring Jordan and people are aware of that and we resent that. The, the third thing is that we all forget that Jordan has been accelerating uh, its normalization with Israel. If you go to the north, to the the areas of uh, the the villages where uh, they are they are forcing people to to sold land to the government, to sell land to the government, to build a controversial and unacceptable uh, oil uh, pipeline between Israel and Jordan, which is really uh, stolen Palestinian oil, you will see that people are broken there. The villagers and the farmers are very upset. They feel that the government and the palace have failed them. So it's not just started now. They, they, they feel that the, the, they are readiness to bow to Israel, to bow to America, but not to, uh, to listen to the people. All of the statements coming from the government show total disregard. People are ready to listen if there is respect, but there's no respect at all to people on the streets.
Okay, thank you very much, Lam. It's a very interesting discussion with all of you, and we'll keep a close eye on the situation in Jordan in the coming days here on Al Jazeera. Uh, Lamis Andoni, Rami Kui, and Ibrahim Freyat joining us on Inside Story today. Thank you too for watching. You can always watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can, of course, also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, fully. Batibo and the whole team. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.